Uh, my name is Jenny Kim. This is the director for talent here at the Missouri Park. Um, and we are very excited to be bringing you uh, this workshop that we have today uh, presented by the Disability Resources and Education Services on campus, as well as the Chess Center for Wounded Veterans to talk to us. Uh, we have leaders from there to talk to us about uh, working more effectively with veterans and or persons with visible or invisible disabilities. So uh, I am going to pass it off to Dustin, who will uh, begin uh, talking to us first about working more effectively with veterans. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Everybody can hear me? All right. So just to start off with, I would like to thank Jenny, Jenny and Enterprise Works for hosting this event and letting us come to present today. Um, so as she said, my name is Dustin Lang. I'm the Assistant Director of the Chess Center, and I oversee the academic career services we offer for the student veteran population on campus here. And then uh, following my presentation, Lindsay is going to come up and present about disability and LA training, and then we'll have questions afterwards. So the veteran and LA training. What is the relationship for, between veterans and higher education? Uh, since 2009, there's been an influx of veterans on college campuses. Uh, and there's two main reasons for this. One is the revisions they did to the GI Bill in 2009 that was known as a post-9-11 GI Bill, and then they recently changed it to the forever GI Bill. Uh, that was one of the biggest improvements to the educational benefits for veterans since World War II when they first came out with the GI Bill. And the second thing is the drawdown in Iraq and Afghanistan. Veterans are getting out and taking advantage of those educational benefits. Uh, nationally, in 2018, there was approximately 370 veteran students and 453 active duty military students at four-year institutions. Now, at the U of I, we're not close to a military, a major military installation. Uh, the same, in St. Louis, is probably the closest one. There's an Air Force base out there. So we're not seeing high numbers of active duty here. We're seeing more of what uh, we call military-connected, which would be veterans, reservists, guard, or dependents. All right, so who are these veterans and what should we expect? Right, well, first of all, veterans are, are going to be a little bit older, most of them on average. The average age of a student veteran on campus is 26. We have them as young as 18 if they're in the reservist or the guard, but then we get people that have done 20 years in the military and came back. So we have those outliers, but the average is about 26 years. Um, most of them are married, about 50% are married or have children. Uh, some have, have already been through a divorce, maybe. Uh, they have additional jobs off, outside of campus. Um, being a little older, and if they're married and have kids, they have additional bills. Um, so really what they are defined as is a non-traditional student. Um, but even with, or with their military experience, they are even different from what we would call a regular non-traditional student, just because of their experiences in the military. And also, 60, let me make sure this percent is right, but so yeah, 62% of veterans that are on campus here are um, first generation students. So let's look more specifically at our campus. Uh, we have approximately 356 veterans and 172 dependents. 84% are male, 72% are Caucasian. Uh, what we're seeing also is most of them are transfer students or graduate students, so they're coming here already as uh, a junior coming from community college, possibly. And then we're also seeing a third of our student veterans are graduate students. Uh, the veterans represent all colleges on campuses. The colleges with the most veterans are LAS, followed by engineering, business, ACES, and AHS, by both sides. Possibly 20% have reported a disabling condition, whether it's visible or invisible. So what are some of the challenges that we see with student veterans when they first come to campus? Uh, the, the first and most obvious one is the culture shock, as you would say. The military versus the university are like polar opposites for them. And they're trying to go from a very strict environment to an environment where you got to think for yourself, you got to make decisions. You're throwing a lot of information, but it's up to you to decipher what information is important. Whereas in the military, they're basically telling you exactly what you need to know. Uh, 
since they're, most of them are going to be older, they're going to feel rusty or overwhelmed. Maybe it's been four or eight years since they've been in, in a classroom or what they would think would be uh, a classroom. But this is kind of a, a myth with veterans until they get to campus. Because if they're not deployed when they're in the military, they're often getting sent to various schools to uh, improve the skills that they have or learn new ones. Um, next is they're not being able to relate to younger peers. Uh, if they're four, eight years older, maturity level uh, just naturally is going to be a little different. And so they feel that, but I think the more time they spend on campus, the more interaction they have with, with students, they find out that there is lots of Um There's stereotypes out there. This is probably what we hear from the veterans the most is the stereotypes about veterans. Either this, they're this war hero, hero or uh, they all have PTSD or so forth, or they've all been in combat and so forth. And that's just, it's just not the case. Um, and, you know, they think that every veteran might have PTSD and so forth. So they got to deal with that. What are you doing? So they get out of the military, they want to do the next best thing and take advantage of those educational benefits. Um, but what happens sometimes is they don't think any farther than that. They get, on, they get accepted, they're on campus, they're at a great university, but some of them, and not all of them, but some, are just unsure of what major they really want to go into. So they might be playing around for a year or two in that undecided area. Uh, commuting to campus. This, this might seem strange, but we have some veterans, uh, that the ones that are married and have families. We have one that I'm thinking about. He drives 45 minutes. To come to campus every day. He's got a wife, and they just had their second child this last semester. And just with the cost of living and so forth, it just makes sense for them to live in a rural area. And also, that's where his original family is from. Uh, so he commutes 45 minutes each way. He's a rock star, though. He's, do, he's done his second this summer. He's doing his second internship of Boeing. They already offered him a job. So, uh, but that's something that some of them have to deal with. Uh, the loss of purpose, again, they, in the military, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You kind of have that vision. Uh, when they first get out, come to college, yeah, they know they're going to college, and you know they're supposed to be setting themselves up for that next career. But while they're at college, they feel like, well, what, what's my purpose? Yes, I'm a student, but what else can I be doing? And then the uncertainty. So it's a well-known fact in the military culture, military uh, realm, that... The VA pays out approximately $12 billion a year in educational benefits to universities. So there's, and we're seeing this more with for-profit universities where they really want to attract veterans. They're saying they're veteran friendly, but in reality, they're not. And they have, those for-profits have some of the biggest attrition rates. Where schools like this that do provide a lot of the services, we have some of the higher graduation rates. Our graduation rate on campus is 98%. Uh, and part of that, they're uncertain of what, what is the motive of the, of the university, you know, do they really want me to succeed academically and then on in life, right? right? So our job with the Chess Center uh, is, the first thing is we try to build their trust from day one to show that we are, uh, and that we care, I should say, that we care about that they succeed not only on campus, but then they succeed in a career and in, in life in general, all right? So, Ways we uh, try to build their trust is we have focus groups, we have meetings with students, we send out surveys. What kind of services do you need or what, what could help you in your academic and so forth. We partner with uh, the Illini Veterans, has anybody heard of that? They're a registered student organization on campus. Okay. Um, and they're, they're really active. They do a 5K. Um, they run a, or operate a, a 5K in the fall, or usually right before the, the Carl Marathon, it's usually a couple weeks before then. Uh, but things like that, what they do is they donate, they donate their earnings from that back to the Chess Center. Right. And some that. of the things that they've done in the Chess Center, they've uh, spent some money on uh, improving our gym and so forth. Uh, but we have a really close relationship with them, and what we're, we're doing is we're showing them that, look, you have a voice. And you tell us what you need, and that's our job to provide those services for our day. Uh, second thing is we provide comprehensive services. Any kind of service that they might need, we try to provide at, right there at the center. Uh, 
So we have various transition to academic services. Uh, this could be anything from peer mentoring from other veteran students, student veterans, uh, assistance with finding a tutor if they need it, one-on-one uh, -on -one academic coaching. We also, on the next slide, you'll see we offer some uh, military courses on campus for the students. Our next big area is our career services. And we work a lot with DREZ, um, but also with the Career Center for the different career services that, that we offer there. And we also have the one-on-one -on -one career coaching, uh, where we can help with writing uh, civilian and federal resumes, uh, helping translate their military lingo into the civilian lexicon. Uh, we will send them down to uh, the Career Center to do mock interviews that are recorded. We get those back and we sit down and we say, okay, this is what your strengths are, but more importantly, these are your weaknesses. Let's improve on these. How can we improve on those? Um, we, another major thing is we host different uh, career and networking events. Uh, as this little flyer up there, that was our last uh, employer panel we had in the fall, or our last major one in December. Um, and so we're getting some great companies that are interested and have veteran and disability hiring initiatives. So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, come to us and we'll bring you the population that you're trying to hire. And so there's events where the, like the employer panel will have these companies come in and they will talk about different career internship options within their companies. Uh, most of the ones that are coming from the companies, the recruiters are military, past military people themselves. So they can speak one-on-one -on -one about their personal uh, situation with that, you know, whether it's the application process, the interview process, and so forth. And then we just open up the floor and the students get very engaged. The engagement back and forth between the, the recruiters and the students is amazing. Uh, so we offer events like that. We also do one-on-one uh, -on -one lunch and learn sessions. So if a company wants to come in and just present specifically to that group, they can. Uh, and what we do with having the opportunity to meet these recruiters from some of the top companies around the nation is when we bring them in for these events, I'm also bugging them to say, hey, we have this professional mentoring program. Would you potentially want to be a mentor for our students or know somebody back in your company that could be? So, and I don't know if this will come from now. So our mentoring program is called Can't We Call uh, Professional Mentoring Network. We have a website, www.cantwecall.com. Uh, where potential mentors or potential mentees can go on that website. It tells you more of our mission, what we're trying to do, and connect post-9-11 veterans with leaders from top companies. Uh, but they can apply right there if they want to be a mentor. And then once we have that information, then we get on the phone with them and we start talking uh, about the program. We give them a, a guidebook on basically what their academic year should look like from quarter to quarter. What what are some of the goals that are set? Uh, so even if they're not a veteran, we have um, in the guidebook, you know, just questions and things more about military one-on-one -on -one culture, so they can get somewhat more familiar with that. Uh, we have a very robust relationship also with the VA service. Uh, the closest VA to us is in Danville, Illinois, which is about 40 minutes away. Um, so when I say we have a robust relationship with them, we have two clinical psychologists, a social worker, um, a voc voc rehab counselor who helps with veterans that have a disability. They write a different chapter, the GI Bill, which gives them an extra year and can pay for any accommodations they might need. Uh, and then also we can, if there's a need, a physical therapist and speech pathologist that will come down from Danville and the, uh, they're there twice a week a month. We just met and did another MOU with uh, the Danville VA and their chief of staff. We are going to, starting in October, they're going to send a primary care physician to the center. So if our students want to meet them. And doing this does two things for us. One, it alleviates the amount of time students have to travel back and forth, wait for their appointment, miss class. At minimum, they're going to miss half a day if they go to Danville. Uh, the second thing is it gets them into the VA system and used to it, maybe not comfortable, but aware and knowledgeable about the benefits they have with the VA while they're young versus what we saw with the Vietnam era where a lot of them didn't utilize the VA or didn't know about it, but then once they retired, things start coming back in life and that's what they really need to serve. So we want to get them comfortable, knowledgeable about the VA system. Uh, and another thing is we work with Lindsay and Jez and their access specialists if our students need various uh, academic accommodations, we work with their access. 
Uh, we offer three military-connected courses, and it's probably that falls under our academic services. The first one's a veteran transition and leadership course. And what this does is it helps students, one, get acclimated to college campus, get familiar with college campus, but more importantly, it gets them thinking about where they have been, what experiences they have in life, where they're at now, and where do they want to be in five years. So they start creating goals and priorities to get so their vision comes to fruition you know, within the next three or four or five years. Uh, so we're constantly wanting to think about what's next and what do they need to do now to get there. Uh, the second one is a career development for military connected students. So this is a lot like our career services, but it's just in a classroom setting that's offered to students. Those are both AB courses uh, that follow each other in the fall semester. And the third course that we just added this last semester is Military Veterans Community Health and Wellness. Now this is also an AB course, but this course isn't for military students. This course is designed for students on campus that plan to eventually maybe work with veteran population, whether they're social workers, psychologists, uh, public health, whatever it may be. Uh, so it just gives them more awareness and knowledge of uh, the veteran population, which is really what we're doing here today. Right, so the third thing is we want to provide a space for, for veterans on campus. And we are fortunate uh, to have a lead donor and that uh, donated six million to get this project started, the center started, and we opened our doors in 2015. It's a 30,000 square foot building, and I'm just gonna show you a couple pictures of the place, but basically it was designed to be a open and welcoming place where students can come and study and interact with each other, but also what's different with uh, that sets us really apart from any other university is on the third floor we have 14 residential rooms where veterans uh, can live there throughout the semester. And we, what we do is we bring in different scholarships from donors to offset the costs there. So they're living there for $450 a year. Or two students have a full-time scholarship where they live there for completely free. So, uh, but yeah, so there you see on the first floor we have the big lounge. Then you got the dining area where we have a lot of different events, or uh, and then the kitchen area, which is a shared kitchen for the 14 residents on the third floor. But it also uh, is set up to be a, uh, a classroom. There's a projector in there, and we have nutritionists come in and do nutritional workshops. It's also a free, me a free meal for the students, but they learn how to eat healthy and on a tight budget. So they really like doing that. And then even with uh, our students that do live on the third floor, a lot of times they'll have like. Sunday movie and, and dinner night, where they'll cook a big dinner for everybody. So it's just that really that family, that tight feel when they're there. So, um, on the bottom middle here, that's one of our lunch and learn sessions we had with Amazon in uh, April, this past April. Uh, but this is also where those three classes, I'm sorry, those three classes are offered that we said that we had. Um, also on the first floor, uh, on the other side, of the building is what we call the pinnacle wing, but there's also this child's playroom. And what this is designed to do is uh, the counselors or therapists can observe the interaction between the parent and the child, or if the parents are in getting counseling, it's a safe child playroom that the children can have. Uh, and then on the second floor, we have our gym, uh, which we updated with some more, some more free weights last year with the Line Eye Veterans. And then also on the second floor, we have uh, different classrooms that can be used. We offer yoga and mindfulness training. Uh, there's some different exercise studies that some grad students uh, conduct right there at the center using that space and support. And then the third floor is, if you ever seen a bear room, anybody ever seen a bear room? Uh, well, this is very similar. It's a, just a small room, your, your bed, just a necessity, a TV, uh, a desk. And, but what's good about this is they each have their in individual bathrooms, so they don't have to share a bathroom. Uh, but that bathroom is quite huge, and you might say, well, why is the bathroom so big? And you might be wondering, what is that thing on the, on the top there? And so each room has a track system in it to where we can put a shear sure lift system. So if a veteran is in a wheelchair, it can transport them throughout the room. If you've ever been over to Beckwith, very similar setup that Beckwith has. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that track will go all the way around into the bathroom. Okay, so investing in the veteran population, you know, um, yes, it's the right thing to do, but we also believe, and because this is what happened when 
they weren't investing in the Vietnam era, is that if we invest in it, it can prevent lost productivity, reduction in their quality of life, increase homelessness and suicide rates, domestic violence, family strain, and increase disability rates. But it can also, investing in our students can also uh, improve a variety of work environments. Think of the skills that they acquired when they were in the military. And these are skills that a lot of companies want. They're mostly known as soft skills. A couple hard skills up there, but most of them are soft skills. These are the skills you're not learning in the classroom. These are, well, you, you may be, but not as much as you probably did in the military. All right, so those, they, they bring these various skills to the table, as you would say, or to the work environment, and also to the classroom. Um, but, and if you look at that list, it's similar, very similar to the National Association of College and Employers top 10 skills that recruiters or companies are wanting and what they're hiring for. So when you look at the job descriptions, you're seeing a lot of these soft skills that a lot of companies want the same skills. All right. So just to end this part of the presentation, uh, fact or myth? Veterans have lower GPAs than national average. You're not going to hurt my feelings one way or the other. Myth. Correct. It's a myth. Uh, veterans have a 3.35 GPA where the national average is 2.94. So, uh, second thing, student veterans prefer to earn degrees that are similar to their military experience or occupation. Myth. myth. 63% of them go into fields that are not similar to what they did in the military. And then some things are just not really all that translatable. If you think of the, the infantry, I mean, mostly they're told to go to be a policeman or something like that. But there's not a lot of skills you learn in the military for that. It's just not translatable. The, the soft skills are. But what you actually did, I think, definitely not. All right. Uh, less than 10% of students Vets go into STEM or business fields? Fact. Myth. Uh, actually, 27% uh, of veterans in college go to, uh, are in the business field, and an additional 14 are in STEM fields. 46% uh, of student vets work full-time or part-time while in school? Fact. Fact. They're non-traditional students, they're older, they probably got more bills, they might be paying on the house daycare, and so forth. And then 32% to use federal student loans and personal savings while in school. Fact. And what, where that correlation is, if you look at the percentage of our graduate students, a third of our veterans on campus are graduate students, that GI Bill is good for that, for, for it should get you through a four-year degree. It's good for 36 months, so if you're looking at nine months academic year, times four, that you get them through that undergraduate. If they go on into grad school, then they just got to start thinking about getting personal loans or using some of their savings that they save in the military. All right. So thank you all again. Next is Lindsay Haight. Okay. First step down, getting my presentation up. That's a joke. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my name is Lindsay Haight. I uh, provide career services for our students with disabilities. So, obviously I can't tell you everything about disability in 20 or 30 minutes, but I hope that I can give you some information and that you actually leave with more questions and that we can continue to talk about this more. So, how many people are interning at Research Park right now? Okay. How many people work at Research Park? And then, is there like an other category? <laughs> Others. <laughs> okay, great. I just want to get an idea. Um, thank you guys for coming and for your time. So, um, like Jenny and Dustin said, Disability Resources and Educational Services, or DRES, you'll hear it referred to either way. So, we provide all the academic services for students while in school. I'm not going to really cover everything that DREZ does. I'm just going to talk about a few things about disability in general. 
But just know that we provide services, like Dustin was saying, academic accommodations, counseling, um, physical therapy. So I'm not going to go into too much of that. Today I really just want to talk about like what disability is, visible versus invisible disabilities, because I think that's really the biggest piece that society is more be becoming more aware of right now. Um, intersecting identities that people with disabilities have. Um, accommodation statements, um, which is a really easy thing to integrate into what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis that creates a more welcoming environment. Um, and then talking about some accommodations in the workplace and why you might want to hire someone with a visible or invisible disability. And feel free to raise your hand with questions. We're also going to have time for questions at the end. So I don't know if you can read that very well, but there's a lot of different definitions for disability. But um, we use the American Disabilities Act, which is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So if you think about what's a major life activity, walking, sleeping, eating, breathing, thinking, caring for yourself, hearing, speaking, learning, working. So if you think about, there's a lot of different types of things that could affect one or more of those areas. So I just want to give you an idea. This is our stats from last year for the types of students that are registered at DREX. And I'll talk a little bit of more about what those are. But um, so we have physical disabilities, uh, systemic or medical learning disabilities, ADHD, brain injuries, psychological, which is the primary, see, um, deaf, hard of hearing, and then low vision, blind, and speech. So if you go back, just to go back, so like ADHD and psychological, those would typically be invisible disabilities. So when we think about disability, most of us think of a wheelchair, right? But the majority of students on campus, you just looking at them would not know that they have a disability. So I also want you to think about your workplace that there are probably already people with invisible disabilities that are just not disclosing or not out because it's a lot of stigma and that's what we want to work on. So some invisible disabilities, learning disorders like dyslexia, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, uh, psychological, anxiety, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia. Uh, sleep disorders, so narcolepsy, uh, Tourette's is a neurological. And then another large um, area in our college population is the chronic health conditions. So like severe allergies, diabetes, cancer. Um, so just thinking of affecting all one or more different areas in your life. Someone's taking a picture, so I want to make sure they get it. <laughs> So right now our numbers have gone up to 2,800 students, and you might be surprised that 74% have invisible disabilities. So that's the majority of the population that we're working with. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts or questions before we move on with that? I also want to introduce, so I, my colleague Aaron is from the autism program, so he and I work together to support our students with autism, um, and my goal and my job is to help students with disabilities get internships and jobs. That's part of why I want to present to Research Park, not just to bring awareness, but I want to get students jobs. So U of I, you know, created this position. My position is new as of October. And they said, you know, we want you to help people get jobs. And then I turned it around and said, why is U of I not our biggest employer? So that's one of my goals, is that we need to represent what we're talking about here on campus. 
So if you think about um, intersecting identities, so having a disability is only part of someone's identity, and they might even not identify with that as a major part. So if you think about if um, you have gender, ethnicity, when they got the disability. So we have people who were born with a disability, then we have acquired disabilities from an injury. We might have people who have known they have had ADHD since grade school, and then people who came to college and just figured that out. So people could be in a variety of different places with how they view themselves. Um, their age, sexual orientation, religion, uh, socioeconomic status. So if you think about someone who has an invisible disability, is African American, LGBTQ, okay? So not just thinking of someone as disability as being like who they are. It's one element of how we all view ourselves as, you know, intersecting identities. And that seems to be something that comes up a lot for our students. Any thoughts or questions? So some people think accommodations mean that people are getting an unfair advantage, like they're cheating, like if they have accommodations. So it's not something, first of all, U of I has a blind admissions process. So anyone that gets in has gotten in without their disability status being known about before. I think that's important to know that they are there because they deserve to be there. Um, but if you look at this, um, these pictures, I think it's really important to understand that sometimes equality doesn't equal equity. And so as you can see, like for the person that's yellow in the, um, the ground below them is a lot lower to begin with, and the fence that they have to get to is higher. So what we want to do is make sure that everything is equitable, and that's what accommodations provide for people. So if I am in class and like I can't access the information, if um, I'm deaf and there's no closed caption on a video or something like that, like I'm not really able to even be at the level playing field. So that's one thing that I think comes up a lot with accommodations is even professors that meanwhile say like, I don't want them to have this unfair advantage in class. And it's really not about that, it's about getting them to be able to be at the same level. So one thing that is really easy, but I think it's important, is any event or training or anything that you might offer, just putting an accommodation statement at the bottom. Um, you know, if you require any accommodations or have dietary needs, anything that can help you more easily participate in this event, please let us know. Because that lets people know it's a welcoming environment. And Saying the word disability is helping to get rid of that stigma. Um, I'm thinking, so I have done a ton of events. I put this uh, statement on all of my events, and I don't even think I've had more than one person contact me. So it's not that people really will give you a lot more work, but it like makes people know that they can feel comfortable attending. Um, and some people also say, like, okay, if you have an invisible disability, why don't you just disclose it? And it's, it's because of fear of stigma and discrimination, for one thing. And then also, how integrated that person views their disability within their identity. So I think starting to just have accommodation statements um, and bring that up will really help people feel like their environment is welcoming. Is that something that happens right now where you work? Okay. Um, the other thing with accommodations, so I think they scare people because we don't really know what that means, what to do, 
That's part of why I'm here. I have my card and materials about Dres. You can call and use us as a resource and we can help you. The issue is it's not like a one size fits all. It's not like if you're blind or low vision, here's what you're gonna need. Or if you're at if you're on the autism spectrum, these are the accommodations. It's a very customized process, but it's usually pretty easy actually. And it's less than $500 on average to provide accommodations for our employees. And this is really, um, if you haven't heard the word neurodiversity, I recommend you just looking that up because this is really another talent pipeline that companies are coming to us and saying, we don't know how to reach people with disabilities, but we want to because like, their perspective and view is going to make our team more well-rounded and more diverse. Um, I'm trying to think about some typical accommodations. Might be like noise-canceling headphones, not sitting in an open space. Um, like, I don't know if it's hard for anyone to focus in this presentation right now. I mean, I think it could be distracting for a lot of people, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, so that might be one thing to just like think about if, um, depending on who's your team, where they're sitting, where they're meeting, what they need. Um, also, sometimes people need to have more frequent check-ins with their manager. Like, I, like uh, if someone says, I can't stay on task for like two weeks on a project on a sprint, like maybe I can check in like every three to four days and work on things like incrementally. Like those can be accommodations, so they're not that hard to implement and I can help you talk through that. Most of the time the person with the disability is the expert on themselves. They know what they need, so it's really, um, it's also that people with disabilities aren't, they don't want accommodations when they don't need them. They want to do what they can do without accommodations as much as possible. Any thoughts or questions? So, um, I know that we probably want to open it up to see if you have anything for Dustin or myself. Um, one thing I want to mention for the fall is I'm partnering with all the major career fairs on campus and Jenny helped with the Research Park Career Fair in the spring. So we're offering um, pre-networking events for students with disabilities so that like maybe the engineering career fair is huge, it's overwhelming. Um, students can come to Drive, meet with a select group of employers who've opted into disability hiring and it will be a smaller, more intimate setting. So we have a bunch of those coming up in the fall if you're interested in that. Um, but I want to open it up to you. I know we'll get a brave, at least one soul with a question. Um, yes? What's the best way to approach the, 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 the person with the disability? Is it better to approach first or wait until they ask for some help? That's a good question. So he said, what is the best way to approach someone with a disability? Do you wait for them to approach you? Um, which I think the answer is yes. You would wait for them to approach you. I think you can bring up if there's concerns. Um, so what I see is usually people with physical disabilities, they can't hide it. They're used to talking about it, so they're going to say, here's what I need, you know, and here's what I don't need. But the invisible disabilities are typically the ones that you might be seeing negative performance reviews or, or issues on teams. So I think bringing up what's going on, but you really, unfortunately, you know, you can't say, we think you might have a disability, you haven't told us about it yet, you know. I think that's why putting the accommodation statements and like talking about diversity is important. But if once they've disclosed to you that they have a disability, then I think you can have those conversations. Does that help? Anyone else? Yes. All right. So, what are the related 
background of all the people that are studying with people with disabilities are a little more towards atheists or are they have religion? Yeah, that's a good question. So what is a religious background? So the thing with disability is it spans across everything. Every college at U of I, every race, every religion. So there's really no um, religion correlation. Um, I think we have we have everyone. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to say that we have um, our biggest colleges are engineering, the grad college. So a lot of our students are grad students or PhD. And then um, LAS, which is just the biggest college overall. So it kind of correlates um, with the size of the school. Any other questions? For me or Dustin? He and I work together a lot because our populations do overlap sometimes. Yes. Are there ways to get involved in, I know like you mentioned Dustin, mentorship opportunities essentially. So for students either on the veteran side or the facility side, um, like collaborative sessions or collaborative ways, not just networking, not just job specific, but like, hey, here's this, like, but on like, a voluntary basis. Yes, and yes. We are starting Thank you. We're starting a mentoring program. Dustin is um, definitely ahead of me in that process, but we're starting one this fall. So if you're interested in being a mentor for someone with a disability or a veteran, um, I can also use volunteers for the networking events. And then if you also have a, sorry, I'm trying to, I can stay focused. <laughs> um, if you have something like a special skill or something of interest, you can come and do a workshop for students. So um, I had someone from the Career Center who has an etiquette business on the side. So like she came and presented professional etiquette tips, for example. So really any way that you want to get involved, um, definitely let me know. I'd love to explore that and talk about it. And the same with, with the veteran population. And what I would also add to that is I would reach out to the registered student organization. Like with the veterans and the Illini veterans, I know there's different RSOs within DREZ and so forth. And that would, I mean, we can put you in contact with them, but that, that way you can start brainstorming with them what they might need and then what you can help out with. Any other questions? Once going to us, yes, Jane. So, as an employer, if what what do you do if you get if you hire someone, they ask for an accommodation, and there's just nothing you can do to actually accommodate. So, you mentioned oh, yeah, open space you. or a small space. What what if you just don't have space? She said, uh, if you're an employer and someone asks for an accommodation that you cannot do, so that is a really good point. That it needs to be a reasonable accommodation. So you cannot expect the job itself to change, but it has to be reasonable for the employer, which is very um, sticky sometimes because the size of the employer is important. So like what might be reasonable for U of I compared to a small mom and pop shop, like that would be different. So it's kind of vague and we want to help you with that. But just one example was there was a receptionist who had trouble focusing and she asked if the TVs could be off during her shifts. So the employer came back and said, we want to leave them on, but we could mute them and let's try that. So it's a little bit of a negotiation and talking back and forth. But I think if, if this is the office workspace, then if they can't work in that, like that wouldn't be reasonable unless there's something you could come up with, like maybe two days they work from home or like something like that. It is, it is a negotiation and it's not straightforward. I think that's what scares people. Anyone else? Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it, guys.